Well, kia ora everyone. As um, Mark introduced me, my name is Rachel Taurale and I am a food enthusiast, even more than a foodie. Uh, but more specifically, my passion is New Zealand's food culture. My commercial role of choice is the development of the protection of our food culture here in New Zealand. So taking those who catch, our fishermen, closer to those who cook, that being our chefs. Making me, in essence, a fishmonger. My family's always fished and I adore seafood. I lived in the US for eight years working for New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, assisting New Zealand food and beverage companies in accessing the North American market and in selling the proposition that we are a world-class producer of food and beverages. While in the States, I watched an inordinate amount of work going into the catching, farming and harvesting of New Zealand food products and equally a monumental amount of work going into the cooking of those products when they reached the restaurant kitchens. What existed between the two, however, uh, appeared to me that there was a lot of risk, uh, a lot that could serve to disrupt the process and diminish the product integrity. And I felt sure that I could do it better. So I returned home to New Zealand after eight years and set up Yellow Brick Road. The aim of the game was to take the chefs that I'd been working with in the US closer to the source of their New Zealand seafood to add an unprecedented level of traceability to the fish that they were working with and to get it to them in the same pristine condition in which it left the water. In the course of sending fish to the Northern Hemisphere, I took some of it and gave it to a couple of local chefs who were blown away and professed it to be better than any fish that they had seen come through their kitchen. And I was taken aback. I was um, mortified even that I had been overseas singing the praises in the US of New Zealand's gastronomic goodness and domestically we were getting shortchanged. I understand export and uh, sending the world our best products. I'm a card-carrying member of the export, f export fraternity, but what I didn't understand and don't support is not equally having those products available domestically. The products need to be on a par with what heads overseas, but they need to be available nonetheless. Fast forward a few years and I now no longer export as I've a vested interest in our own food culture and ensuring that we're the best versions of ourselves right here at home. In a nation built on tourism, a cornerstone of which is food and wine, it's really imperative that we do this. The fishermen that I work with catch responsibly on day boats using long line methods with their catch certified by Friends of the Sea. When seafood tastes really delicious, it's generally because care has been taken all the way from the catch to the cook. The fishermen and the chefs I work with care for their fish, their environment and their family's future in a sustainable manner. Over a wine with a great chef friend of mine a couple of years ago, we decided that more needed to be done, that we each knew great, interesting people with brilliant stories, that we needed to create a space in Wellington for Wellingtonians and visitors to the city to meet the people behind the brands of their coffee, meat, seafood, cheese and bread and more. The city market was born in June 2009 and now runs every Sunday morning at the Shepherd's Dock building on the waterfront advertisement. Uh, and it's really good, it's fantastic, it's a lot of fun, there's stellar food, stellar produce and craft beers and wine sold by the people who make them and it's fundamentally created community through food. New Zealand's strength in the food world is proximity. No one lives more than 100 kilometres from the sea or a vineyard and it's this proximity to the inland sea that should dictate that we are inextricably linked to the source of our food. This is our food culture. In an interesting book I once read, the author examined the relationship that people in Britain and France have to their own food culture. In France, the language of food is second nature, with every person you meet able to point you to the nearest taste delights. Home is where you unearth the passion and the influences that create this, with the finest versions of French food found in the Michelin-starred restaurants. By contrast, Britain, where the food culture is such that you find the mainstay of that culture in restaurants, and if you ask a local of where to find the best food, invariably you end up at an all-hours curry joint. So which are we? Do we have the foundation of France and Italy with stellar versions in our restaurants? Or are we led by our dining scene with little if, or if any foundation to support the movement? I'd like to think it's the former, that our upbringing has given us the privilege of knowing good food and wine. Whether it's the idea of food, the practice of dining, or ensuring the sustainability of our resources, food culture is about appreciating what we have and protecting it. To bring it all the way back to Yellowbrook Road and the city market, with an eye on the future of resources and food culture, my commitment again is to take those who cook closer to those who catch, to know the source and to assure that we are the best versions of ourselves right here at home. If our land is farmed responsibly, our waters managed sustainably, we eat well and our health as a nation improves. If we cook, we engage with family and friends, creating untold amount of energy and goodness. And so from a simple idea of slinging fish, 
comes a significantly grander movement. What I'm endeavouring to impart to you is passion. If you don't have a passion for what you're doing, if you don't love it, it will never be as successful as it could be. There doesn't have to be a greater good or a good a civic nature to it, but you do have to be about 5,000% committed to a success. Outside of this sort of informed passion, if there were a couple of other takeaways that I could give you as you embark on the Bright Ideas Challenge, they would be these. That you are your own value proposition. If you are not your company's most valuable asset, then you'll be doing it the hard way. I don't have a team of people who work for me, yet I manage many. Fishermen, chefs, careers, accountants. With none on the payroll, or few on the payroll, there's no firm incentive for those on the yellow brick road to behave in a certain way or to perform to a certain level of excellence, which means I need to lead and motivate through inspiration. I have to maintain a certain level of enthusiasm, passion, commitment, drive, and excellence that gives others the peace of mind that you know what the hell you are doing. In startups, in the world of startups, it's fundamentally important because the world is awash with bright people who have bright ideas. Consider who you need to know and who you do know. Networking is an art that I admire in Americans. They literally have a black belt at it. It's an incredible skill to attain as it boosts your confidence and you meet some very, very interesting people. And yes, I am one of those people who talks to you on a plane. I think about what you read. You have to immerse yourself in your business through reading, which includes the likes of Twitter, TED, and Facebook, and the various other mediums. It's an opportunity to be the best at what you do, to maintain a broad perspective on the market, and therefore maintain your edge. You have to be honest, which of course is fairly self-explanatory, but you can't afford to be anything less than 100% off it without exception in your startup. Don't say no. Americans, as well as having this black belt in um, the art of networking, unusually rarely ever seem to say no. They take a breath, contemplate, and if they can give it a go, they will. At all costs, I try not to say no. So nine times out of 10, there are ways that you can make something work for people if you take that little bit of extra time or make that little bit of extra effort, and it will engender great loyalty to you, your idea, and your business. Find somebody who inspires you and from whom you can seek advice. Mentoring is a really commonplace and popular uh, exercise, a really valuable exercise, and I don't have a formal mentor, but I certainly have a couple of people in my professional life that I would turn to for advice. Um, I'm actually in, in awe of both of them, which I think is a good thing because you need to be in awe and really have great respect for the people from whom you're seeking advice. I would advise you to spend some money and do it early. Get an accountant, a lawyer, and spend some money on developing your brand and image. It's money really well spent because in the early stages of your business, it's my feeling that your, the perception of your business needs to be greater than its actuality. Furthermore, you need to get the legal and the numbers straight. Think long term. I'm a director of Wakatu Incorporation at the top of the South Island, which is an incorporation with um, interests in property and food and beverages, tohi wines, Aotearoa seafoods and Ngātahi horticulture. Uh, Māori business is an interesting kettle of fish, if you'll excuse the pun. It's incredibly complex and an interesting process of culturalising commerce. The motivation that I feel to succeed within Wakatū is unquantifiable, but it's a definite feeling that I'm doing uh, my piece in this part of history. So people have gone before me, many people will come after me, but I need to get it right for right now. We have not a five-year plan, but a 500-year plan. So it's called Tipai Tafiti. What can we do now to ensure the sustainable success for those who are coming thereafter? Nothing happens in an instant in Māori business, and it's intergenerational, from which I take the idea that we shouldn't get in business with an eye on how to get out of it. Think long term. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, I would say to you to back yourself. Few businesses go by the book, but if you do, they are infinitely more prepared than others. But in saying that, there are times when you just need to go with your gut, to trust your instinct and to back yourself. If you're in this room, then you've already started that process. It's a hugely exciting time for you. You're at the beginning when you have this great opportunity to get as much possible as right as you can. And organisations like Grow Wellington are there to connect you and to inspire and to facilitate your success. And we're at that stage, I would be jumping on those services in a heartbeat. So uh, in conclusion, I wish you well with your bright ideas. We're all around. Um, as Marcus said, it's a really great innovation community, and I've had lots of coffees talking about lots of bright ideas, so I'm happy to have that conversation with you also. But I wish you well.